My name is Brendan Scott, and I'm the historian in residence at Cavan County Council. And in this final episode for 2022, we'll be discussing the survival of a wonderful record of the Sinn Féin Doll Courts held in Drumlane Parish from 1921 to 1922. A meeting between East and West Cavan and Sinn Féin was held in the Town Hall in Cavan in late September 1917, which established the Sinn Féin Parish Courts in Cavan. There were to be three arbitrators or judges appointed from each parish, one of whom could be a curate, the other two to be members of Sinn Féin. And in June 1919, the Dáil decreed the establishment in every county of national arbitration courts. Uh, so so uh, this decree began the implementation of a policy which had been long advocated by Arthur Griffith. Um, in 1904, Griffith had urged the desirability of establishing such courts, citing many historical precedents, uh, both domestic and foreign. And he wrote... Uh, that not less important to the nation than a national civil service or national courts of law. Hungary understood this and established arbitration courts, which superseded the courts which Austria sought to impose upon her. Ireland, before O'Connell retreated from the proposal of erecting a de facto Irish parliament in Dublin, had also established such courts. And of course, uh, Griffith uh, was a, had Calvin links. He was the Calvin MP uh, before his death in 1922. Uh, initially, these uh, courts, these parish courts, were tolerated uh, by the British authorities as being a useful way of settling bitter agrarian disputes, which they wanted no uh, hand or part in. Uh, and as there was nothing illegal about arbitration, the initial arbitration courts could operate alongside the British court system. But bit by bit, people began to use the Sinn Féin courts uh, more and more and the British courts less and less. And the Dáil courts uh, were founded in June 1920, uh, following on from the 1919 uh, 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 decree. And at this point, by June 1920, the British government began to resent uh, these uh, Sinn Féin courts, these Dáil courts, as it was felt that these courts were acknowledging that a republic, an Irish republic, would, would uh, be declared soon, which was not what the British wanted. It wasn't something the British wanted to give away too easily. Uh, as Lloyd George noted, I shall have to tell the Irish that we shall have to scatter these courts. Griffith and Collins, while uh, negotiating with the British in 1921, assured them that something would be done about this, which was always quite unlikely, given that Griffith had been one of the prime movers behind the establishment of these courts in the first place. Now, the, the recognition of Dáil Éireann and the arbitration courts and the Dáil courts were also recorded uh, in various urban district council minutes throughout Cavan. On the 5th of July 1920, uh, Cavan UDC, Cavan Town UDC, acknowledged the authority of the All Aaron as the duly elected government of the Irish people. Uh, and they undertook to give effect uh, to all decrees duly promulgated by the said Dáil Aaron, including the establishment of the Dáil Courts. On the 10th of September 1920, Cavan UDC again made a resolution recognising the authority of Dáil Aaron as the only elected government of the Irish people. On the 4th of uh, October 1920, Bill UDC unanimously agreed uh, to recognise no government of Dáil Éireann. And Milturbert UDC also gave assurances that they would refuse to go into any courts to prosecute or defend cases barred the parish arbitration courts. Indeed, one of the Milturbert councillors, a guy called M uh, uh, J. H. Quinn, noted in November 1921 that he did not see why the town hall should not be used for arbitration courts. He happened to be present at such a court a short time ago and never saw fairer decisions and justice all around. There had been arguments at Biltorba UDC meetings in December 1920 and in July 1921 over what court to present various people to, the British court or the arbitration or doll courts. Uh, Coot Hills Parish Courts, they were also heard by at least one member of the UDC as well. So they were very much um, part parcel of 
of the growing uh, uh, nationalist movement uh, in in Ireland at, at this time in in the nineteen late nineteen tens into the early nineteen twenties. Uh, now, not everybody agreed with these courts, however, and uh, although there are reports uh, of Protestants using uh, the courts in Ballyconnell, but a guy called Frederick Howell from King's Court, a Protestant from King's Court, in an application to the Irish Grants Committee, uh, he recounted an incident in which his tractor was wrongfully seized uh, by a man called John Carney, uh, who impounded it, uh, acting under the colour of a Republican warrant, which had been signed by John Carney himself. Uh, when Howell tried to rectify the situation, he received a summons to the Dáil Court, which promised to resolve the issue. Instead of, of attending the Dáil Court, uh, Howell informed the British Army and instead had the court broken up, an act which he said was in accordance with his position as a Protestant and a Loyalist. This, unsurprisingly, made him no friends in the locality. What I really want to do today is discuss uh, the court records of uh, the Drumlane Doll Court, which are now in the safekeeping of the Johnson Central Library. Uh, they were they were donated a few months ago um, uh, by the family, and this uh, th this is is the book itself. As you can see, it, it probably needs a bit of TLC at this point, but it's a wonderful survival. Uh, it's a, it's one hundred years old, and um, it's a wonderful survival uh, from that period. Uh, and the book contains the records of the Sinn Féin Dáil Courts for the parish of Drumlane from the 12th of November 1921 to the 22nd of September 1922, a period of just over 10 months. The court uh, apparently was normally held in Cadham's Barn in Drumlane Parish, which I believe is still there. And the records were kept by John O'Reilly from Drumlane, who was secretary to the Drumlane Sinn Féin Courts. His son later brought them to Dublin and they were rediscovered again uh, by a grandson, Niall O'Reilly, in 2021. Uh, and it was Niall who donated very generously, uh, donated the book uh, to Calvin Library, as I say, a few months ago. I think uh, I, I spoke to the family uh, the day the presentation was made and I think they said that they had memories of one or maybe two other of these books, uh, which haven't turned up yet, but uh, hopefully they will turn up. And to be honest, it's great just even to have this one. It's, it's wonderful to get. Um, there are 40 entries in the book. That's the way the book is, is laid out. Uh, you have the date and the name uh, of the judges, the names then in the next, in the third column uh, of uh, the plaintiff and the defendant. Uh, the next one, the next one there, which you see is empty there, is the witnesses. And then uh, what the nature of the complaint was or what the issue was, uh, how it was resolved, and then a signature uh, of the of one of the judges. Even though there's three judges listed there, there's only one of them signs, and that's generally the case uh, throughout. But there are 40 entries in the book, um, so uh, most of the book is is empty. It has it hasn't been used. Uh, there are very rarely, as I say, you can see there very rarely uh, any witnesses involved. So it's normally you know the two people uh, who are involved, uh, the plaintiff and the defendant along with the judges, uh, they're the people who are named. Uh, but those involved were also allowed legal representation. They're never noted in the court records. Occasionally, uh, the ruling itself isn't entered either, uh, which is an oversight. Each entry, as I say, is signed by one of the judges, usually, but not always, William Fitzpatrick. And you can see in, in the uh, 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 this over here at the far right column, that's uh, William Fitzpatrick's signature there. Um, even though, as I say, there are normally three uh, uh, judges present, uh, Fitzpatrick himself, Patrick McGuire and Patrick Gaff. I now want to discuss the nature of some of these cases themselves. One of the most interesting type of cases are the three bought, brought by the local rate collector, a guy called Hugh O'Reilly, against people who had failed to pay their rates. These cases were heard on the 26th of November 1921, and as Ireland was still under British rule at this time, you might think that the failure to pay rates would be part of a larger movement or resistance movement against British administration in Ireland, something that Sinn Féin would surely support. Yet, in each case, the judges favoured the rate collector. It may be that the men were not paying the rates, uh, knowing uh, the likelihood was that Ireland uh, would gain its independence shortly and, and were hoping to avoid the payment. Uh, the Anglo-Irish Agreement uh, was signed in London on the 6th of December. 
10 days after these cases were heard. But likewise, the judges were also uh, likely aware that the rate payments would continue uh, following independence. So uh, what would now be, would instead be paid to the Irish government. So they probably didn't want to set a precedent by letting these uh, fellas off. One defendant, who was the final one, who had seen how the other two had gone, settled out of court. But the first two were required to pay the amount due, which came to nine pounds and twopence and 12 shillings and fourpence, uh, respectively, along with costs, which amounted to 10 shillings, six shillings and a penny, respectively. It was noted that the second defendant, uh, who had the smaller amount to pay, had paid 11 shillings and a penny at court and uh, was given two months to pay the remainder. More rates were chased again in May 1922, which proves that despite the change in authority, some people just really did not like to pay their rates. A lot of the remainder of the cases come from the everyday small concerns that take up a lot of time in what you would now see as suppose probably like a small claims court sort of idea, including unlawful possession of a house and unpaid bills. One interesting case took place on the 4th of February 1922 for failing to pay back a £5 loan. What is interesting about this case is that, is that the two gentlemen, whom we will call Gentleman A and Gentleman B, were involved in two cases that day. In the first case, A brought B to court over the failure to pay the £5. Uh, this is, uh, uh, it was being said it was a loan. It was ruled that the £5 be paid back by Gentleman B, who also had to pay the costs. But then on the same day, a second case was heard in which Gentleman B, who had lost the first case, brought A to court over A's failure to pay B £5 for timber. And this was settled by awarding Gentleman B £2.10 shillings for the timber. So what it seems was going on was that B was refusing to pay A until A had paid B for the timber. So it was a messy sort of a situation, uh, which probably could have been settled easily out of court. It really didn't have to go to court that one, but there you go, it did. Uh, one case which was settled out of court, however, uh, was one which included uh, involved a blacksmith uh, who brought a farmer to court on the 7th of January 1922 uh, for non-payment of 12 shillings and sixpence for shoeing a horse for the defendant. This was, as I say, settled out of court. Incidentally, the 7th of January 1922 was the day when the Dáil ratified the treaty, which was a day of massive significance and importance uh, in Irish history, which, you know, we're, we're uh, remembering all those events now. Uh, but even though these momentous occasions and, and, and things were happening, occurrences were, were taking place in Dublin and in London, in Cavan, everyday life uh, carried on. Uh, and so in Drum Lane Parish in County Cavan on the day uh, which brought such change to Ireland and to the British Empire, uh, a blacksmith was owed money and he was going to get it no matter what was happening in Dublin and London. Uh, a more mundane type of case or a more everyday sort of a case involved two men from Kilcunny, uh, one of whom was a shopkeeper. Uh, the shopkeeper had pay, had failed to pay the plaintiff £3, 12 shillings and fourpence for goods sold and uh, delivered to the shopkeeper. But unfortunately, uh, the outcome of this case isn't recorded in the book, so we don't know uh, what happened there. Uh, cases which occurred uh, outside the parish but involving someone from the parish could also be heard at Drumlea Court, as is the case in this next example. Uh, th th this case involved a female shopkeeper from Ballinamore who had been passed a £3 check uh, by a Milltown man. Uh, the shopkeeper had cashed the Ulster Bank check for the defendant and given the defendant £3, but when she brought the check to the bank to be reimbursed, they would not honour it because the guy didn't have uh, the funds in his account. The shopkeeper was awarded the £3 as well as 10 shillings travelling costs and six shillings and a penny uh, court costs. And this shows the fairness of the court, as they may not have been expected to rule against one of their own uh, uh, in favour of an outsider. <laughs> there was another interesting case uh, which involved an RIC constable, which was heard on the 1st of April of 1922. And it might seem surprising that an RIC constable would use the court, but his name was Maguire, he was probably a Catholic. Uh, and he summonsed uh, two cases heard that day, he summons uh, two local men for cycling during what is noted in the in the record as lighting up time without using a light himself, 
i.e. he was cycling in the dark with no lamp. For this, the defendants were, were fined a penny and costs. Uh, the RIC were eventually disbanded on the 30th of August, 1922. But probably the most serious case uh, was heard on the 23rd of May, 1922, when the Milltown IRA brought four men to court uh, on the charge of burning Milltown Hall, which, according to the court notes, had happened recently. The case was adjourned for one week, and three of the men were allowed out on bail of £20 each, which was a considerable amount of money. Uh, the second, the, the suspected ringleader, however, who we'll see in a moment, was referred to as a prisoner and was not released on bail. There is no further mention of this case in the court record, but the anglo celt does provide us with further information. The second hearing was held in Staghall uh, Schoolhouse, uh, not in, in, in the barn this time. And the man who had burned the hall was an ex-British soldier named Thomas Battles, who had been living in Arden and was now a carpenter and a painter living in Kilachandra. Although the record doesn't say whether, uh, 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 whether many were present, uh, at the, the, the doll record that we're looking at here doesn't say if generally many people were at these hearings, uh, the self reports a very large crowd present at this uh, second uh, uh, hearing. Uh, solicitors were present on behalf of the plaintiffs and defendants. Battles claimed that he he had he uh, had been uh, promised ten pounds by the other three men who burned the hall. You would have thought there was a lot of you know halls or buildings being burned at this time. Oftentimes, you know barracks and military barracks and RIC barracks and things like that. And sometimes a hall would be burned in 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 reprisal. Uh, that sort of thing happens happens a bit, but it it doesn't seem to have been political in nature. Uh, this particular uh, 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 burning, and instead, the three men uh, who had hired battles to burn the hall had a grudge against the local priest, uh, because he had refused them the use of Milltown Hall for a dance. So they hired battles uh, to burn the the hall down. Uh, he 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 got five pounds uh, uh, for it, but he doesn't seem to have received uh, the second payment uh, for burning down the hall. He admitted to it and 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 gave a lot of detail. In the court record, uh, I'm going to leave that particular story there, but it is one that I'm going to revisit at a later point because it's a really interesting story. Uh, the courts uh, around Ireland uh, were wound up; these dull courts were wound up in July 1922 uh, in a decree made by the Provisional Irish Government in the midst of the civil war. But it was not until early 1923 that they stopped entirely uh, across Ireland, uh, following the establishment of the Irish Free State on the 6th of December uh, 1922. But the Drumlean records that we have here end in September 1922. Uh, in conclusion, I think the creation of the Sinn Féin Arbitration Courts is one of the most uh, remarkable achievements of the Dáil Executive between 1919 and 1922, and moving on into the Dáil Courts as well. The records uh, which survive for Drumlane Parish, thanks to the foresightedness of the O'Reilly family and their generosity, uh, are a wonderful glimpse into the everyday lives of people living through extraordinary times and demonstrates the importance of saving records and paperwork to make it available uh, for everyone to see. Uh, so just if, if anyone is interested in, in any further reading about this, you can always look up some of these cases uh, uh, cross-reference them in the CELT uh, and then we have the original book itself, the Dahl Court Records, uh, which are now held in Johnson Central Library. There's a guy called James Casey who wrote a couple of really good essays uh, in a journal called Irish Jurist uh, which discusses uh, how the Dahl Courts began and, and talks about the arbitration courts in the Republic and the Dahl Courts uh, in the early 1920s and they're well worth uh, having a look at as well. And Dermot McMonagall uh, has written uh, a short piece as well uh, about uh, the arbitration courts and, and their setting up in History Ireland uh, in 2007, and you can uh, get a look at that as well. Uh, so just to conclude, I suppose, uh, as usual, uh, my thanks as always uh, to Cabin County Council, especially to the library staff for all of their continued help and support. And in particular, I want to thank Emma Clancy, uh, the county librarian, uh, Sinead McCardle from the Good Hill branch and Jonathan Smith as well from the Cavan branch who were such a help to me uh, putting these together. Uh, there is a wonderful series of lectures uh, which will be beginning um, 
in late October. So keep an eye out for those as well. And they're going to be discussing both local and national events during the decade period. So as I say, keep an eye out for those. Uh, and thank you to you all as well for tuning in for the last of these webisodes for this year. Um, I really appreciate it and the support and the kind words uh, that I've received uh, over uh, my time as a uh, historian and residents. I really do appreciate it. And hopefully uh, I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.